The Sibiu summit, like so many others, on Thursday and Friday of this week, will end up coming out with more anodyne press releases when what we need in Europe is radical, urgent action. So today's event is all about what the European Union needs to focus on over the next 20 years. And it's a very unusual look at the future of Europe. There are plenty of projects on the future of Europe out there. What's unusual about this one is the time frame that we're looking forward 20 years, the fact that it's got a really diverse group of very active people involved. The European Reformists is a group of people that is not anything like the kind of wise men reports that we've seen before on the future of Europe. For one thing, there are more wise women than wise men in it. Secondly, there are no retired prime ministers. Everybody in it is actively involved in their own community and in their own sphere of activity. And their diversity is a huge strength. They have diverse views, diverse expertise, um, drawn some of them from government, but many of them from other areas, from community action, uh, from social projects, and of course from the private sector as well. This report is also unusual because we have tried to look at what the lives of future Europeans will look like. So we've looked not just at the challenges for this generation, but also the next. And this link between generations is a core feature of this afternoon's event. So uh, one of the factors is that uh, we were hoping to have on stage this, this afternoon um, Anuna de Wever, the youth climate activist uh, from Antwerp. Unfortunately, she's not able to join us because of a family emergency. Um, it's just not possible for her to come, which is a real pity. Um, but uh, you've all seen the, the cause for which she stands and also the, the strong position that she has taken on the need for radical and urgent action. And Commissioner, Commissioner Vestager will talk about that too. We also have a link to succeeding generations in the form of our European avatar, Claudia. Claudia is over there. She's going to be born on Thursday, the 9th of May, on Europe Day. And the report follows her through her life from the moment she's born into, there she is um, in the second thing, as a young girl um, uh, asking for action on Europe. And then it follows through to, um, as she grows up, the kinds of experience she and her parents have. Now, Claudia could be any European born this week. And the idea that behind using Claudia the Avatar is to think about um, what life will be like for Europeans over the next 20 years, what kinds of challenges they'll, they'll face, and what kinds of major changes they will see in life experience. Claudia's parents, Lucia and Peter here, have grown up with the expectation that their lives will look like education, work, retirement. But in fact, things may change quite radically in terms of the arc of life. They're worried about climate change. They're worried about the sustainability of the job market. They're also worried about pensions and the sustainability of social welfare systems. And the report is about how Europe can manage the huge transitions that are coming owing to climate change, owing to digital transformation, and of course social change because of demography, aging populations, and how automation will affect the economy. And our argument, in a nutshell, is that the European Union has a vital role to play in managing these transitions. These transitions are coming whether we like them or not. The question is, do we manage them well or do we manage them badly? And our fundamental argument is the European Union is the key missing link with the convening power and the resources to manage them well. Um, so the report is a rallying cry for the European Union to refocus those resources and its political attention on those three, big three, major challenges. So I hand over now to Tomasz Walaszek, um, who is our partner in this um, at Carnegie Europe. I'd also like to say a big thanks to the Bozar, with whom we have co-produced this event. Uh, they've been fantastic, and we're very glad to bring in the dimension of art. Um, we started with, uh, we've, we have uh, three uh, Brussels artists who have thought about some of these issues. So we started with the, the famous quotation from, from, uh, from uh, Magritte, uh, Ceci n'est pas un pipe, we have Ceci n'est pas un sibiu. We will go into the exhibition of Bernard van Orley, the 16th century Flemish painter, who painted many uh, scenes which involve life, death, aging, climate change, and technological change. And of course, there's also the Bruegel exhibition uh, here in this building, the Bruegel prints, which have many of the same themes in them. So over to you, Tomasz. Brilliant. Many, many, many thanks, Heather, and many thanks to the Open Society and European Policy Institute for what was a wonderful and exemplary collaboration. Many thanks to Commissioner, many of the reformists, and all of you for coming and helping us 
refocus the European Union. Now, obviously, we haven't yet started the conversation on what exactly the big three changes are, nor have we gotten to the part where we explain how to fix or address the big three changes. I don't know how many of you have read the wonderful report. I hope quite a few, but presumably many haven't. Let me point out that a number of the things we recommend here are not easy. So some of you, as you listen to us, may be tempted to point out, along with Jean-Claude Juncker, that we all know what needs to get done, we just don't know how to get elected afterwards. We still think it's worth delving into the difficult issues anyway, for two reasons. One, the sense of paralysis, right? That, you know, we all know what needs to get done, it's just politically too complicated, is precisely what feeds the popularity of the populists. They come up with easy solutions, they come up with placebos that they know it won't work, but they realize it's going to function politically, it's going to deliver the points. So the first reason why we wanted to tackle the three big three changes was, you know, obviously to help prepare the Europe, but also to present a bit of an antidote to the populist narrative and the false uh, dilemmas, the false problems, they are elevating so that they can knock them down. The second reason why we're for our optimism, the second reason we felt the confidence to delve into the difficult issues is that it's not like these, uh, some of the answers and some of the recommendations and some of the prescriptions we prescribe, it's not like they are not being tested. In fact, when you take a close look at what's happening around Europe, when you take a look at a lot of the, well, either national governments, but more importantly, even below that, when you look at communities, families, neighborhoods, you find that a lot of the things that we prescribe, a lot of the things we recommend, are already being tested. They're already being put to practice. When you look at the German energy commons, what a wonderful example in many ways, right? Citizens, neighborhoods getting together to pull their money and acquire renewable resources. Today, about a third of all of the uh, renewable energy in Germany comes from these citizens' initiatives, these commons. So our second reason, the reason we are optimistic and the reason we wanted to tackle these hard questions was because what we propose is not impossible. It is doable. In fact, it is already being done at the local level. So thanks again for coming. Do read it, do help us. Refocus EU, that's the whole theme of the, uh, of the event today. And with that, let us get straight into the substance. James? Hello, everyone. My name is uh, James Cantor. I'm the editor and founder of EU Scream, which is the progressive politics podcast from Brussels. Please have a listen. Um, it's my absolute pleasure to be here today with Margrethe Vestager, who's the uh, uh, Commissioner for Competition Policy for the European Union, and also a candidate for the European Liberals to succeed Jean-Claude Juncker as President of the European Commission. Um, most of you know her well. Uh, you know her work over the past five years, imposing significant penalties on Silicon Valley companies for misdeeds uh, in the uh, realms of antitrust and competition. Uh, sadly, as Heather uh, said, we are missing Anuna de Waver today. Uh, let me just make mention of her because mm -hmm. she is one of the icons of the school strike movement in Belgium. Uh, where there have been some of the biggest and most dramatic rallies in favor of rapid action on the climate. It's even led to the toppling of a minister here. Uh, we'll open up, we'll uh, chat for about a half an hour, and then we'll open up for 10, 12 minutes of, of questions. Please identify who you are when you ask your questions. Um, Commissioner, I wonder if at Anuna's age, 17, you too would have been a climate striker. Missing Fridays. No, because what we worried about back then would be nuclear war. Um, it, I'm sort of the generation we had what we called Easter marches. It was when we had sort of the terror balance of uh, missiles being uh, put up in uh, uh, Western, Eastern Germany, uh, in the USSR uh, back in the days. And we were extremely worried about this uh, because the tension uh, about it and the lack of political action was uh, what prompted us uh, to hit the streets. So you were an activist back then. In term was it, were you a disarmament uh, figure or were you somebody who just said... I was just someone carrying a sign. You were somebody carrying a sign. Okay. Um, you know, let's just quickly reflect on the kind of opposition that young Anuna has faced. 
uh, and perhaps I could get your thoughts on that. She has been told by Flemish conservatives not to believe in the apocalypse, to go back to school, and then, as I mentioned, there's this case of a Flemish Christian Democrat minister who had to resign after falsely stating that Anuna had intelligence about protests being a setup. So the suggestion was mm -hmm. that there were foreign, there was foreign interference here. Has that kind of backlash surprised you? Yes, it has. Uh, of course, it would have been wonderful if Anuna had been here. I fully understand her reasons for, for, for not being here. But both for her, for Greta Thunberg, uh, to meet with people who seem to have a greater respect of uh, scientific reports than people two, three times uh, older than themselves, that I find thought-provoking. Uh, and also to say, people saying you should go back to school, well, why would you go back to school if the scientific reasons for not going to school are so overwhelming? Uh, because I think there's one thing that is a given for any society on our globe, uh, for any uh, uh, congregation of societies like the European Union, dealing with climate change, that's a given. It's not something that you can choose to do or not to do, it's a given. We can discuss how to take action, how to approach it, in what speed, but it's not something that you can choose to say, no, I don't believe in climate change, so we will do something else. That's not, that's not the choice we have. Yeah, I, I, to me it was just remarkable to see the amount of backlash from conservative circles against these young women who are you know, standing up for these issues. But I think it comes from a combination of, uh, of uh, fear of change and fear of women. Uh, the latter thing being quite widespread. Right. Now, <laughs> there, there are a lot of uh, men and boys in, the, in, in these uh, climate school strikes, but the leadership is young and female, and there are some particularities about gender and climate. I don't know if you would want to speak to those, but it, it, it does seem like there is a role for women to stand up here, given the fact that women seem to be disproportionately affected by the climate change that's coming. But women are indeed being disproportionately affected, and of course, in particular, women in countries that are very affected by the effects of climate change that cannot be avoided. Uh, because that could very often be, be women who have a strong responsibility for the household, for the family, for finding fuel, for cooking, for growing vegetables. Very often you'd find women responsible for the agriculture uh, of the household. Uh, also, when you are displaced or have to take refuge uh, from flooding, from droughts, uh, very often women are much uh, harder hit, having to live in refugee camps, that do not respect uh, the privacy, the risks that women face, uh, if you don't have such banal things as probably lit streets in a refugee camp, so that you safely can go to the toilet, uh, go to take a bath, there's a completely different set of threats to women that are not being taken into consideration, which is why in all sort of uh, the, the sort of the parts of the chain uh, of effects of climate change, women will be much harder hit uh, than the average man. Right, I, and just to go back to the, uh, the disarmament days and, and the, the missile protests, it's interesting to reflect. I mean, there were quite a lot of women involved in protests at that time. From a British perspective, I would recall the Greenham Common protests. So it seems like, uh, without trying to sound like I'm um, trying to you know, sing the praise of women too much, women are in the avant-garde. But you can, you can. <laughs> okay. <laughs> women are in the avant-garde of, these, of these, uh, some of these movements that yeah. cross borders. Yes, but unfortunately, uh, that is not uh, a characteristic of our globe. We still have to fight for equality in, in pay, equality in power, equality in parental leave, uh, the latter being part of the key because the fact that women are very often also the care person in the family is part of what uh, results in inequality in power and inequality in pay. Right, right. Now, Commissioner, last time we met, I asked you whether you believed it was time to cut off public subsidies uh, to fossil fuels in order to incentivize carbon dioxide reduction and to level the playing field even more so that new technologies that were carbon reducing could emerge on time 
to stop the planet burning. And your response was a measured and mm -hmm. cautious one. You warned that moving too quickly could create more yellow vests. You said the risk is, of course, that you have the Champs-Élysées burning, and that doesn't really work. Mm. Can I get you to expand a little bit on this tension between acting now and social disruption if we act too quickly on climate? Well, the point is, of course, if, if we can find solutions that will tick every box, of course, we can act uh, quickly. But if we cannot, uh, in an inclusive way, there is a huge risk to alienate many people who may already not feel counted in, may already not feel to be part of society. And if you, on top of that, move very quickly without uh, making this an inclusive uh, process, there's a high risk that you will get a backslash. Uh, if you take the way that, for instance, uh, some of the coal mines are not now being closed, uh, it's not all done in a very inclusive manner, but at least people are really trying uh, to address uh, the issue of uh, reskilling, of investment in the region, uh, changing sort of the business and uh, work-life perspective of the people who can not, no longer work in mines. And it's a very uh, it's a long process and, of course, it goes very deep. Because if you have been uh, made a living from, from uh, working in mines for three, four, five generations, it is also the culture. And, and you have to take that on board when you change, so that people uh, is part of this change, is part of designing change, in order to see that this is something we are all part of and we want to change for the better. Uh, because I think any kind of, of top-down bears a huge risk of resentment and revolt as any top-down procedure for whatever good or bad reason uh, that is being uh, uh, pushed. And I, I mean, I, I can only try to communicate what Anuna might say in response to that, but I think the Anunas of this world would say that issues like extinction and planetary limits mean we really need to turn the way we do things upside down, even at the risk of social disruption, uh, right now. Uh, they don't want to wait for the transition uh, that you have described. But sometimes these processes is like painting windows. It drives you crazy that first you have to take off the old paint and you have to, you know, prepare for the first uh, layer of uh, coating and then do the first layer of coating and then to uh, redo with sandpaper again and then for the second layer of coating and then for another time of sandpaper. And then eventually you can take this white paint and it will look beautiful. If you just do the white paint first, it doesn't work because it will come off the first time you have bad weather because the ground was not prepared. So there is a risk that it may be fast, but it will not work because you get the backslash even so, so much more. Uh, and I don't see any reason why people who have other concerns as well as climate, uh, like security, cybercrime, uh, where are my sons and daughters going to make a living, that they shouldn't be as concerned about climate change as anyone else but maybe really lacking someone to see, well, there is a perspective for you as well to be part of this. Uh, and this is why I find it's very important that uh, the movement and the change is an open, inviting change. Of course, there will be real hardcore opposition. We see uh, the people who do not believe in climate change, which is um, strange. Um, but I think you also have a, maybe even a majority of Europeans who are just, you know, accepting the fact that climate change is happening, but still are waiting for the invitation to be part of it, both systemically and individually. So, I mean, one, one thing about this is that Emmanuel Macron, the president of France, has been somewhat criticized for his handling of that diesel tax. Um, have you had the opportunity to sit down with him and say, how do we do this better? 
No, I, no, I haven't. Uh, what we have been doing in, in my own home country earlier on is, of course, to use taxes as a means of, of change to affect people's behavior. But, of course, trying to compensate uh, low-income households with what we call a green check, so that you de facto uh, annul uh, part of the effects and at the same time, of course, inviting everyone to be on board when it comes to uh, using uh, energy and other resources in a much more uh, thought-through way. Uh, because the least uh, both polluting and uh, carbon footprinted uh, energy is, of course, the one you don't use. Uh, and this gives a lot of opportunities for action. Uh, for everyone to be part of that, while at the same time, of course, never trying to escape the fact that this is also systemic. You cannot change the entire, the entire energy production, production in Europe by individual uh, actions and demanding different kinds of energy. You need systemic action, but you need, also need to make people come on board to see, well, I am part of this, I can do something as well. Not to belabor the point, but I mean, in the past, there were these sort of rich-poor divides in society. And just to sort of channel Anuna one more time, I mean, I think that what's happening there is that you are seeing an intergenerational mm. tension. And I just wonder whether, you know, communicating to these younger people that they are going to, you know, have to paint the window with the undercoating first is really going to work for them. Well, I think, I think it's my generation who's the problem. <laughs> I think to a very large degree, the grandparents, they see it uh, just as well as the young generation. But if you see just the emotional debate about meat, one wouldn't believe it, but the emotions coming from when someone is suggesting that uh, you should just fully stop eating meat, or maybe just for one day uh, per week that you cannot use bacon as a sprinkle on everything you eat. Uh, the aggression that comes from that tells you what you have to do. Um, and, and people who have been suffering for unemployment or risk of unemployment have seen high degree of youth unemployment. I think it is very important to say, well, this is not a jobless uh, effort. On the contrary, a fully circular economy, a fully sustainable economy, has the potential to create many, many jobs, but it will be a completely different kind of growth, and it will be approached in a different manner. Uh, and yes, I know it takes time, but we need to know what we're doing, for instance, by having a green GDP so that we realize, well, where are the resources going and, and how do we figure out if this is actually working? So, uh, Commissioner, were you to become the next Commission President, what would be the one policy that you would introduce beyond green GDP, uh, you know, that would be sort of climate friendly? Well, I think that uh, no matter what happens uh, in, in the near future, one of the things that also is being discussed by uh, parties running for the European Parliament is how to organize this. And to some degree, I think we need to have a matrix organization because a number of things are given, just as in this report. Uh, climate change is a given. We got to deal with it. Uh, the technological revolution is a given. We got to deal with this. Uh, the entire concept of uh, social issues, inclusive, being part of a society, what is called aging, uh, in this report, that's a given. And it has to be reflected in everything we do. Um, and it may not seem climate change related, but I think the first obvious thing to do is to make sure that the Commission is completely gender balanced. Because you, you get a much more, um, uh, I think, diverse um, uh, discussion and approach uh, to problems of this sort if you have a much more diverse set of, of people to deal with it. Because when you break the uni uniformity in how you look, you also break the uniformity in the way you think. Right, and I'm sure Anuna would agree with gender balance in the next European Commission. Um, Let's, let's talk about this word, and here I'm going to try and press you a little bit more on the policy front, a just transition. This is often associated with uh, the mm -hmm. transition to a fairer, greener economy. What does, that, what does that mean for you? 
the just transition? Does it, does it have certain sort of policy implications, in particular for, let's say, allowing countries to spend more? Perhaps they need to break the deficit rules to build those hydroelectric dams or those windmill parks. I think it, for me it's difficult to answer in, in, in one or two uh, sentences because a, a just transition is also a transition where not, for instance, only uh, households uh, because of taxation um, makes a contribution to the reinvestment. You need the business side on board as well, which is why corporate taxation is a very important issue. Uh, we have been working a lot with a set of rules that allows for energy intensive users uh, to be relieved of quite a lot of the energy taxes. Uh, and the reason for that is, of course, that this is a global uh, uh, issue that has not been solved globally. And when you have uh, energy intensive users that will compete with uh, production outside of Europe, uh, there is a huge risk that they will not be able to maintain it, even though their energy footprint is so much uh, better, uh, that they use better production methods, that the salaries are more fair than yet what you would find in other places. You shift, um, in order for them not to being forced out of the market, you shift the burden from contributing uh, to the transition from them to other businesses and to other households. And there is a risk to this, because all of a sudden, all the burden is on households. And that makes it very, very difficult because you find households in any uh, budget bracket uh, in Europe. Um, some, for some, it is very important. What is the price of electricity? What is the price of uh, transportation? Uh, and it is important that people can uh, heat their houses, can transport themselves back and forth for, to work, uh, to visit family. Uh, so a just transition is a transition where uh, you don't just push the bill to the many, but also make sure that those who have the means uh, actually do uh, participate, which is why one should uh, consider the entire tax system uh, in, in this respect. Right. I mean, that, that's a quite sort of radical uh, policy set of policies that could be instituted and one of the major questions about uh, the report today is that with these major major issues about lifetime planet technology this could see the EU thinking really really big about areas of policy that it doesn't automatically have a role in but when it comes to reform of the tax system we are talking about a bigger role for Europe there aren't we Yes, indeed, because when, when you have uh, global companies who, to a very large degree, have the uh, means and sometimes the, the necessity uh, to figure out, well, what part of this holding should pay taxes in what country, uh, there is a risk that taxation will escape. Uh, I've seen that in, in the casework that we've been doing, in the Apple case, Fiat, Starbucks, NG, numerous cases, uh, where a member state has enabled uh, corporations that make a, not only a huge turnover, but also huge profits to escape taxation. Uh, so we need both to make sure that digital as well as non-digital uh, companies uh, contribute in the same way, and we need to make sure that we apply a minimum of corporate taxation, because otherwise, eventually, with the dynamics as we have them right now, there is a risk that we will lose corporate taxation as a source of income. And not only do we need to finance uh, fighting climate change, we also have welfare societies, uh, social safety nets, uh, health, education, talk about lifelong education, reskilling, all of that, to be able to finance that. And you cannot just leave it to the individual to pay for, for reskilling over a lifetime, because this is part and parcel of fighting climate change that you can reskill to be able to uh, do something else uh, throughout your lifetime. Because as it was said uh, by the in the beginning, next generation will not have schooling, work, retirement uh, as three different uh, uh, parts of your lifetime. It is highly likely that we can make that much more woven in together, uh, depending on preference, uh, depending on your life skills, depending on uh, how you would want to see your life perspective yourself. 
with that wonderful synthesis of the report, which I've read and is really a great read. So if, if you do get a chance to read it, I highly recommend it. It's one of the best written documents out of Brussels that I have <laughs> ever had the pleasure to read. So it's, it's a good one. With that excellent synthesis of the report, I, I would very much like to open it up to uh, our, our, uh, our attendees. Could I have a show of hands, uh, an initial show of hands for who might wish to be, who might wish to ask some questions? I see one there from Valentina. I see one there uh, from Stefan. Yeah. Um, and you all can think of your other questions. Let's start with Valentina. If you could just introduce yourself as well. Does it work? Yes. Hi, Valentina Pop with the Wall Street Journal. I have a question regarding these um, discussions and projections about the need for a new competition policy. We've seen all sorts of um, ideas brought forward by the French and the uh, German ministers and um, wanted to um, hear your thoughts on what would be, if, if you see the need to change and what exactly that would be. Well, I do see the need to change, but maybe not so much in the same way as the German minister. Uh, because where I see huge challenges for the market actually to serve consumers would be in the effects of the Industrial Revolution. Uh, because with uh, digitization, uh, biotech, uh, all kinds of very advanced technologies that is changing uh, business logics, uh, how to produce value, how to be present in a country. Uh, it is very important that we make sure that you still have fair competition. And the role of data in a modern economy uh, is changing a lot of the way that value is produced. Uh, that, by the way, is not climate neutral either because it takes a lot of uh, energy uh, to produce and crunch uh, data in the amount that we would want to crunch it. Uh, I met a researcher recently working on quantum computing. Uh, when he's uh, you know, pressing his button to do his uh, experiments, uh, he would use the same power as a mid-sized uh, Danish town. Uh, but that being said, uh, that in particular sort of uh, is a challenge to make sure we, that we get that right. Because you can have innovators, you know, very clever uh, entrepreneurs with the best possible algorithm, but it will be uh, not as well working as an old worn out algorithm if the old worn out has access to all the data and the top of the pop doesn't have it. So yes, I do see that we have some scope for change or for challenging our tools to be able to be used uh, in, in a changed economy. Uh, but that would be sort of my perspective and, and my push because this is where I see that we are most thoroughly changed, uh, challenged. Uh, in other areas, there was made a, a value choice when the treaties were written. And that value choice was for the union to be based on fair competition. And it was a choice, because the Chinese has made a different choice. Uh, the Americans, to some degree, a similar choice to the European, but also with some variations. Uh, and this has served as well. And uh, part of, of, of the markets is helping us uh, now we're talking about fighting climate change because of, for instance, auctioning of subsidies has now allowed us to build the first uh, wind uh, turbine uh, parks with no subsidies. And, and if the market can help us to transition in a cheaper way, we can do it faster. So if I've understood you correctly, no compromise with the French and the Germans on their request to change the competition laws? Well, it's, it's very high level still, so that makes it, of course, difficult. But um, the thing is, where, where I have a number of still of unanswered questions is this idea that you should enter uh, politics into the casework. Uh, an idea that maybe sort of the European Council could say, well, uh, the Commission got it all wrong, uh, we will now decide instead. Uh, if the Commission is doing a, a case uh, that ends up in a merger being prohibited, sometimes we would have been going through 700,000 documents. 
We would have worked intensively with competitors, customers, regulators all over Europe to understand the market logic. Uh, we will have found concerns, and only if they cannot be solved by the businesses, we end up with a prohibition. So my questions for the Council would, of course, be on what reasons should you uh, reverse this decision? If a competitor disagrees with you reversing this transition, should the competitor be able to take you to court? Uh, what transaction could actually be, be um, overseen by the Council? On what basis? Should it be in some sector? Should it be from some particular country? Should it be some particular size? And the reason why these, can, these questions are important for me is that this union is a union built on the rule of law. And it is the fundamentals. It's, it's a matter of the heart. Because the minute someone is more equal than others, we have a problem. Stefan. Thank you, Stephen Boucher of Outfit uh, Dreamocracy, Collective Intelligence for the Common Good. I'm proud to be here with some of my students and, and delighted to have contributed marginally to the report of which I'm very proud to be associated with. I had a question for you, Mrs. Berstager, because the very last paragraph is about, uh, the very last section is about the EU's role in bringing it all together, the recommendations in this report. And the last paragraph is about building a partner state. And I'll read for everyone's benefit the, one of the sentences. Societies need to shift from top-down policymaking to horizontal co-production that treats community leaders as co-creators of policies. So this triggers a, a suggestion and a question. Suggestion would be, maybe in the next commission, what would you think of having a DG emulation in addition, perhaps, or as a reinvention of DG competition, in the sense of how, and here's my question, how could we reorganize the EU so that it plays this role in emulating um, ideas and be this partner state for horizontal co-production that treats community leaders as co-creators of policies? What could be the EU's role in your view? Should we reinvent the subsidiarity principle? Should we do something in that respect? Thanks. Well, you, you see part of it already because you see that, for instance, cities play a, a very different role today than what they did five or ten years ago. Uh, we see that also globally. Uh, and it was, as it was said initially, a lot of the things in the report is things that are being tested in smaller settings, uh, which is one of the reasons why you say, well, this is doable. Because a lot of the technology is here already, a lot of the organization is here already, uh, a lot of the changes that we need would be innovation in organization rather than a technological fix. Of course, we need new technologies as well, but there's no reason to sit back and say, oh, until we have the new technology, poof, we can do nothing. Because just if you use modern pumps, you would, I think, half uh, the use of energy for those purposes. So a lot of the stuff we know already, a lot of the organization we know already. Uh, I think what would be important uh, would be to say, well, this is also about uh, the role in the work as a commissioner. Because sometimes I think it is being very much limited to seeing yourself as the one taking initiative to new legislation uh, or to police whether things have been implemented in the right way in member states. And I think you can broaden that to a very large degree uh, also to say that maybe we don't need new regulation here we need the way that people work with existing regulation, maybe in a different way. Uh, a number of my colleagues, uh, I think, have been doing great work uh, in doing this in this uh, mandate by making people come together from different strands in life, uh, sometimes also unexpected uh, strands in life, uh, in order to find more common solution. You need people working with environment and nature to work with people representing uh, agriculture, uh, you need people from different strands of research uh, to come together in order to find sort of uh, cross-section uh, interests. And the reason why I mention this is that it becomes easily something difficult 
So to very last degree, I think one should use the existing setup, uh, existing uh, treaty uh, framework, but push for the roles to be exercised in a different way to allow for a different way of uh, enabling action. Because I think that is, that is the main thing, that is, we need to take action. Uh, and you know, of course, that from the first uh, uh, impact assessment to the first public consultation and the second public consultation and the presentation of the legislation and the negotiations in Parliament, in Council, then trialogues, then decision, then transposition into national legislation, easily five years, easily five years. Uh, and here, my guess would be, we have a lot of legislation that we could use already in order to push for some of the changes that you're asking for. Commissioner, do you have time for a last question? Indeed. Okay, terrific. Uh, Alberto, yes. Thank you. Alberto Lehmann, I'm a professor of European law and policy at HEC Paris. I'm also a European reformist. And since you said that it's very important to take action, uh, my question for you is, what do we do today with policymakers, the incoming members of the European Parliament, the new political leadership, who will be expected to take action vis-a-vis -vis Facebook and other social media platforms, while at the same time needing those platforms in order to get elected, in order to run for office? How we can get out of this conundrum, this hindering conflict we face, and perhaps including yourself in this historical moment, you face this kind of dilemma. We need them because they have this essential infrastructure, utility, network that nobody else can reproduce. But at the same time, we need to take action and we need to do things while also being in power or controlling power. But, but sometimes it is a question if, if, we, if there is this conundrum. Because are we really dependent on a network where two billion people can be connected at the same time? And isn't it anyway an illusion? Uh, because as far as, as I have learned, I'm not myself active on Facebook, people very often um, confine themselves to their own echo chambers. Um, and I think it is very important that we stay on top of the democratic responsibility to give our societies direction. And I think it's very similar to the other industrial revolutions, from the enthusiasm of the steam machine and all that could be achieved and things could go faster than a horse and all of that, uh, then realizing that some of the human consequences to that were very, very severe. Working conditions, uh, how children were oppressed, all of that. The difference here in this industrial revolution is that the pace and the scope is so much faster. Uh, which is, of course, why we need the legislator to be on top of that process, because otherwise we will not have technology that serves humans. It will indeed be the other way around. Uh, and we will have no idea who is then the controlling forces uh, behind the technology. Uh, and this is why I say that the technological revolution is one of the things that's a given. You cannot say, uh, stop the world, we're getting off here. Uh, you have to figure out how to deal with it uh, in order for uh, technology to serve humans, which is one of the reasons why uh, we have adopted, colleagues of mine have worked on sort of ethical guidelines for uh, artificial intelligence. Because otherwise you have to say, well, you can only have your artificial intelligence when we have an equal world. Because otherwise artificial intelligence would just reproduce all the biases all the problems that we have already, uh, because you know, sort of the very simple data equation, garbage in, garbage out. So there's a lot to do for the legislator to give our societies direction so that it is us as citizen and electorate that decides what society we would want to have. And I'll just take a question. Um, is it Ka Catherine. Catherine, yes, um, behind Alberto. Thank you very much. Katarina Materno, I'm Deputy Director General in DG Neighborhood and Enlargement Negotiations. I think your ambition of having more women and working in a joined up way actually go together, but that's mm -hmm. just uh, an aside. Uh, quick question, if you were to be the new president of the European Commission, how would you address the fact that 
traditionally the Commission has competencies and therefore expertise in areas where it has a lot of a key, where it has legislated. Your department is the perfect example of that trade as well. One of the big three challenges is demography that goes through social spending, adjustments, lifelong learning, education, all the areas where the Commission is, um, the EU is traditionally very weak and it spends a tiny amount for people who may not know, the EU spends 1% of GNI per capita, 99% is spent in uh, member states. How would you address that dilemma since indeed uh, it's really the, the problems are cross-national and they are also crossing the EU and member states divide, which seems to be fairly strong in some areas. How would, how would you go about addressing it? Well, the, the thing is that uh, there's a lot to, uh, to build on. Uh, what my colleague, uh, my institution, has achieved exactly when it comes to, uh, to, the, to social issues, I think is a very good example of trying to think sort of out of the confinement of the treaty and without, of course, in any way violating sort of the division of labor. But what she was, has been doing is to bring member states together and then make it a, a political decision to say, well, we will converge uh, our social uh, issues at a still higher level, not because new legislation says so, not because we have given the European Union new competences, but because it's a good thing. And our political pledge, we take that as seriously as anything else. Uh, just as well as, as this commission, uh, we took ourselves so seriously that sort of the uh, pledge to say, well, at least 40% of senior management should be women by the end of this mandate. No official quotas, uh, no legislation, no nothing, but a decision and keeping ourselves to this decision, we made it. And I think there's a lot of potential also in working like that, because then you have sort of the, uh, everyone is included in the way you work. Uh, and you have uh, all the expertise coming together because uh, the welfare states may sound as the same, but it's very, very different from member state uh, to member state how you organize. And by having people coming together, you get the inspiration as to how do they do in other member states. And I think that is actually more important than having uh, um, even more expertise uh, within uh, the Commission in these areas. Because, as you say, most of the spending is in member states, and this is also why you, where you find the best people, also in universities, university colleges, uh, among practitioners and among unions. Uh, you'd find people who really know what it's like, and in bringing them together, you can push for a different set of results than you would otherwise have gotten. Thank you. Thank you, Commissioner. Um, the, uh, I guess how I'd sum this up is to say that um, if you were to become commission president, I very much look forward to seeing you persuade, convince the member states to adopt green GDP and redirect the tax system so we have more money to fight the climate on the basis that these are the right things to do rather than it being more Europe, which I think is a very sort of interesting way of, of looking I at it. I tell you one yeah. thing, if you label it more Europe, it's never going to happen. <laughs> but if you label it doable, improving quality of life, uh, changing the way our societies work, you have a completely different task ahead of you. Um, and the thing is, also when it comes to green GDP, a lot of the work is done already. You have made the testing, you have made the proxies, you are basically ready uh, to roll out. Uh, because to a very large degree, the data about what we're doing is the key for our actions to have real effect. Terrific. Thank you very much, Commissioner. A big round pleasure. of applause Thank for you. Commissioner Vestigan.